uh, tonight will be in discussion with someone that uh, you might not know too much about, but he was a part of history, a part of our history. We had a lot of heroes and sheroes since we've been in this country that sacrificed their family life and sometimes their own life for the benefit of our people in the struggle. The gentleman we have on tonight worked for one of the icons in our struggle, Malcolm X. It's been a lot of books written about Malcolm, the uh, award-winning piece by Alex Haley, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and other books that have been written on this subject, the subject of Malcolm. Uh, the latest book by a gentleman that just passed away, uh, Manning Marable, he wrote uh, a piece on Malcolm. But we have someone here that was Malcolm's secretary up until the day he was brutally assassinated in February 19th, 1965 in the Audubon Ballroom. At that time, he was known as Jerry Shabazz. Now, he's brother Abdullah, Abdul Rasak, is joining us this evening in discussion to talk about one of our icons in history, Malcolm X. <laughs> brother Rasak? Yes? How are you, sir? Okay, let me correct you. He was, uh, he was uh, executed on February 21st. 21st? Not, not the 19th. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Brother Rasak, let's let's uh let's talk about Malcolm. I know we talked in conversation and you cleared me up when you said that Malcolm was your boss. Talk about Malcolm the man as you knew him. Well, uh in, in order to tell you about Malcolm, I have to tell you a little about myself. Yes. Uh and uh because Malcolm was a reflection uh, and, and myself, uh, the poet says that the eye not itself but by reflection in some other thing. And I saw myself reflected in Malcolm in that I saw my shortcomings, a tremendous number of them, and uh, I saw that many of the things that I thought were true were not true. Some of the things that I thought were good were terrible. Uh, and all of this was reflected through Brother Malcolm as a mirror to myself. I had never shown any respect for any male descended from slaves with whom I had personal acquaintance except as musicians or athletes until I met Brother Malcolm. And that's when my respect for a slave descendant grew to monumental proportions because I saw a man that had all the quality that I thought uh, a man should have. And uh, he was not an, an easy man to get along with. He was very firm. Uh, he did not brook uh, interference with his thought process. He was kind of the educating one, and he did it by example. And uh, he was honest. He was a straight arrow. He said something. If he said he was going to be somewhere at 4 o'clock, he was there at 3.55. If he said he was going to do something, he did it. And he never discussed yesterday's achievement today. Today, he was trying to figure out what he could do tomorrow to make our plight uh, a better one. That's the best I could say. Uh, you know, I, what, you mentioned that Malcolm was a tough man. Yeah. Tough tell, man. tell me a little bit. Tell our audience a little bit about that. Well, first place, if he, if he expected you to meet you somewhere, don't come walking in late. Because he could look at you and make you shrink. Uh, he expected everyone was supposed to be on time. Uh, two, when he wanted you to do something, uh, I had like a, a, a disagreement with him once. I said, man, you brother, you keep leaving here and leaving me responsible for things, but you don't give me the authority to get anything done. 
And he said, brother, authority and responsibility are different sides of the same coin. He said, if I hold you responsible for getting something done, I'm giving you the authority to do anything that has to be done to get done what I tell you to get done. <laughs> I said, well, but, but that changed my concept of management. When someone tells you that they want something done, they expect you to get it done. Malcolm did anyway. Other people leave you leeway uh, because many of them are not capable of doing things uh, themselves, so they leave you an allowance. In the Nation of Islam, we had a saying that uh, there will be men in the ranks who will stay in ranks. Why? I'll tell you why. Simply because they do not have the ability to get things done. And I found out that that was a criterion that Brother Malcolm used. He wanted you to get something done because he got things done. He he was, he was might not have been in a, a business management course or anything like that, but he got things done. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, sir. So, uh, in essence, Malcolm was a man of great intellect as far as you were concerned. He was, he was the only man of great intellect that I've ever met. I, I'll take that back. I met two people of astounding intellect. One was named Gerald Feinberg that I met at the Bronx High School of Science. And I was there for four years and I never, never saw a teacher ask him a question that he didn't answer. And he used to play chess with the head of the biology department and beat him every, every time he, Gerald would beat him. And I think he became the uh, chairman of the physics department at Columbia University. He, was, he had a, a formal intellect and Malcolm was the other one, man. Malcolm, and Malcolm was more astounding to me because, one, he was descended from slaves, not from a long line of Jewish tradition, which had intellectualism as its one of its bases. Uh, Malcolm descended from people where they hung us or killed us if, if they found out we could read and write. Uh, and then he didn't graduate from uh, high school. Uh, he didn't go to college, uh, and no one in his family, to my understanding, I think two of his brothers went to Wilberforce, but Malcolm had not gone to college, and in, in addition to all that, he was incarcerated in jail. And for this man to come out, and again, I have to say something about me. I graduated from Lincoln University, cum laude, uh... I went to Columbia Graduate Business School for two years and the East Asian Institute. I was considered a highly intelligent individual. Mm -hmm. And I met Malcolm, man, and I found out really how stupid, how really, <laughs> how really unaccomplished I was and how faulty my mental processes were. Many things that I thought was the thinking process was merely an exhibition of a program that I had gone through, that I had been programmed to do certain things that I thought I thought I wanted to do. And it wasn't that I wanted to do them. It was like I was programmed to do it, you know? So, uh, and then I come into contact with this guy, and I argued with him, brother. I argued with him for nine months. I went to the mosque every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I went primarily, I guess, to prove how smart I was, <laughs> you know. <laughs> to me, it is, not, it is not a catastrophe to be stupid, but it is real catastrophic to be stupid and think you're smart. And that's where I was. I, was, I thought I was smart. And it was like, I was like an onion. And every time I talked to Malcolm, he peeled away a layer of skin. <laughs> Until he got down to the nitty gritty, and I said, "Wow, this man is—he's really tough." But I assumed that most of the real intellectual skills that he shown that he showed had come from Mr. Muhammad, because he was always saying, "My leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. My leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad." So I said, "Man, this man Muhammad—he must be heavy to turn out somebody like Malcolm." See. But then when the break came between the Nation of Islam and Brother Malcolm, and I uh, associated with him, I found out, man, this guy has a on-the-spot, immediate response intellect that's his own. This can't come from somebody. Okay. So, so uh, that amazed me. 
You know what it's, it was like? It was like if, if you follow music, which I don't. I don't know anything about music. But there is a thing called absolute pitch where some people, they can hear a tone and they can duplicate it. Uh, and absolute pitch, you can't teach someone absolute pitch. They have to have it or not have it. And most musicians do not have absolute pitch. And many people who have absolute pitch never become musicians. Well, Malcolm had absolute intellect. He could look at something, brother, and get right down to the nitty-gritty. He went through the outside facade, the crap, got down not only to the essence, but to the quintessence of the thing. And he did it almost immediately. Okay. I said, man, how does he do this? So <laughs> does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, you talked about Malcolm getting things done and, and uh, you handling things when, when he wasn't around. You know, and and I, and I just want to uh, just talk briefly. In the, this latest book by uh, Manning Marable, yeah. he mentioned about Malcolm being a misogynist. Well, I'm, I'm talking to somebody that was with him. To, to, Let me tell you something. Go ahead. First place, I told Manning Marable. Manning Marable says, well, you know, I know an awful lot. And I said, you know, you may think so. I said, but I'm going to tell you something. Most of my speaking is concerned with trying to straighten out distortions about Brother Malcolm of people who think they know. And all of these people that think they know so much about Malcolm, none of them knew Malcolm. Okay. You got Zach Kondo, you got Manning Maribel, or you got people who were descended from free people trying to write about a man who descended from slaves. People who are descended from free people, they don't know anything about us, especially those who do not want to admit that slavery was wrong. The, the entire United States political structure knows that slavery was wrong. That's why they never mentioned the word slavery in the Constitution of the United States. That's tremendous. And they cite themselves as being the citadel of democracy and yet killed us when we tried to vote. They said that they are a free enterprise system and yet had the greatest slave population in the history of the modern world. They say that we, we are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It killed us for no reason whatsoever and are still doing it, especially if we owned land in the South. Okay. Now, here our women were taken as the extension of the desire of the master. So slavery as a process removed us from our titular heads of our family. So you had a woman who for 400 years looked to the man who owned her as her lord and her master. He could go into her sexually anytime he wanted to. He could go into her and father a child and then take that child and throw it into a, a slave pen because every child that he fathered by a slave woman had a monetary value that a child fathered by his wife did not have. So you had an entire uh, structure built up from this chattel slavery process. Then a man came along and said, okay, those who are in those states that are in rebellion against the federal government, their slaves are emancipated. But emancipate did not mean free, nor did emancipate mean rehabilitated. So even after the slave was nominally uh, emancipated, the women had the same attitude toward the slave master and the ex-slave master that they had before the Emancipation Proclamation. This is still in our women. So Mr. Muhammad came along and he said, look, it is the nature of the male to be dominant over the female. The Quran says men and women are created of the same ruh of the same essence, but the male is a whit above the female. The Judeo-Christian ethic says that the female was created from the male. 
and she was created for the male for the to be the helpmate of the male. Now, for Manning Marable to come along and say that Malcolm was a misogynist, Malcolm married. Malcolm expected from his wife the same thing that the Judeo-Christian ethic says that a slave master expects from his wife. So he says that Malcolm was misogynist, but uh, I was at the uh, at the center that I call the Audubon Ballroom, and Malcolm is saying wherever he went, the women... Uh, wherever he went, that women were held in check, that the society was backwards. Mr. Muhammad said a woman can be anything that she wants to be as long as, as what she is doing is not detrimental to the moral decline of the society that she is in. So she shouldn't be a go-go dancer. She shouldn't be r- r- rubbing her thing around a pole in a, in a, in a go-go club. She should not be doing lap dancing. The mother is the center of civilization because she gives birth to children and then she civilizes them. Because every child that is born is just a little animal. And if you don't civilize him and bring him into the human family, and that's the job of the mother. And I'm going to say this, and this is going to tee off so many sisters. The reason that we are as ass backwards as we are as a people now is because our females have abdicated their responsibility to their children. And the male has abdicated his responsibility to the mother. The child bonds with the mother, not with the father. The fathers should be out working, taking care of the female. This is what we were taught in the nation. Mr. Muhammad said, treasure your women. Educate your women. Protect your women. Don't let anybody come into your neighborhood and father a child by your woman and then leave and you got to take care of them. That's like, I think it's the cat bird. Cat bird don't build no, build no nest. A dirty bird goes and lays her eggs in another bird's nest. So the other bird got to sit on her eggs and raise. So that's what we have been uh, to. Malcolm told me, Malcolm says, brother, whenever you go somewhere and you want to know what's going on, he said, don't ask the, the brothers. Brothers don't know what's going on. He said, ask the sisters. Sisters know everybody's business, know everything that's going on. And Malcolm, I just looked through... Uh, uh, Bureau of Special Services. Malcolm was the first man to put females on the rostrum. September the 7th and September the 14th, I think, 1963. Malcolm put a young girl from How You Act on the rostrum to speak. And I read a book called uh, Temple Number 7. Where am I? I have it in front of me. Temple Number 7. My years with Malcolm and Farrakhan, Minister James Seven X Naji, and uh, Malcolm was about to make um, uh, 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 women uh, ministers. Uh, Malcolm taught the MGT in, in Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, I was in the car with Brother Malcolm once, and he said, "Yeah, when I was teaching the MGT, I said you were teaching the MGT. MGT is Muslim Girls Training and General Civilization Class." And and they are ruled by a sister captain. And I said, how were you teaching an MGT? He said there was no MGT captain. So so I taught him. I said, well, what did you teach him? He said, how to iron shirts, how to sew. I said, are you joking? He said, no. And I was at another, uh, at a meeting, the 40th anniversary of the founding of the OAAU, which was at uh, August something, August something, 2005 or six, And there was a sister there whose husband was Sidney, the former Sidney 2 X Sealy, whose son played basketball for Fordham and got killed in some kind of automotive accident. And she said, Malcolm could crochet too. I said, what? She said, yeah, he taught the, the MDT how to crochet. Uh, he took children to the museum. Malcolm was a man... And we were taught, brother, if Malcolm saw a single brother talking to a sister, he would ask the captain or myself, I was a lieutenant, he said, is that brother working? I'd say, well, brother, you got a job? He said, no. He said, well, tell Malcolm, get out that sister's face. Go out and get a job first. Don't be talking to no sister if you can't take care of her. That, now, is that a misogynist? And let me ask you a question. Did you read the book? No, I didn't. All right. Well... 
Manning Marable cites in the book an instance where Joseph X. Gravit, Captain Joseph, who was Malcolm's captain and sidekick, he smacked his wife. You know, he got 90 days out of the mosque. You see, when you were in the nation of Islam, you couldn't hit your wife, man. Not if she was, not if she was in the nation, too. You couldn't put your hands on her. Now, does this sound like a misogynist? No. Manning Marable didn't know. And I told Manning Marable, I said, y'all people write, write about this, uh, all about Malcolm. Malcolm was in the nation for 13 years and didn't live for one year after he was out of the nation. And uh, yet all y'all want to write about is things that you dreamt up about Brother Malcolm that were not true. And I'm going to tell you this, brother. In the, from March the 12th, March, March the 12th was the day that Brother Malcolm had a press conference and announced his severance from the Nation of Islam. From March the 12th, he got killed February the 21st, so he didn't live one year after his severance from the nation. Now, of that less than a year, he, he gave the press conference March the 12th. April the 13th, he left for Mecca. He didn't come back till May the 21st. He stayed in the United States until July the 7th. July the 7th, he left for Africa and didn't come back till November the 24th. Now, of the times that he was in the United States, many times he was out of the state. He was in Los Angeles. I was in Philadelphia with him. And they threatened to blow up, <laughs> they to blow, blow up the radio station. Sent three pretty women detectives in there and escorted us to the, air, to the airplane. But he was in Philadelphia. He was in Chicago. He was in Los Angeles. He was in Boston. He was in Canada. He was in England. He was in France. Uh, and of the, as I said, of the times that he was in the United States, many of the days he was not in New York. And if he was in New York, sometimes he was at a radio show or something like that. So people who base their opinions of Malcolm on the time that they saw him, even people that were in the organizations that he was in, they still didn't know him. And why do I speak with such force and authority? I knew Brother Malcolm from like 1958. I came in the nation, say, in 1959. Uh, and I was with him from 1959 to 1965. So I saw him in the nation. I saw him out of the nation. I rode in the car with him. I rode in the train with him. I rode in the plane with him. Uh, for a period of time, when Minister Wallace, who was the minister of the mosque in Philly, <coughs> was put in, the, in, the, in prison because he refused to serve in the army. So then the other officials in Philadelphia got sat down, meaning that there were no official positions in the mosque in Philadelphia. So Brother Malcolm was put over the mosque in Philadelphia at the same time he was over the mosque in, uh, in New York. And as a lieutenant, I traveled back and forth to Philadelphia, uh, posting the, 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 the posts, uh, picking the person to teach, picking up the money and the attendance report and bringing it back and, uh, and whatnot. That was in Philadelphia. He was also over the mosque in Washington, D.C. So for a period of time, Brother Malcolm was over three mosques at the same time. Uh, uh, do you know I lost my point? Well, well listen, what we're going to do, uh, Brother Razak, we're going to take a brief break. When we, come, right. when we come back, we're going to go to the phones, and then there's a couple more things I want to talk to you about. Okay, let me start. Now, what am I supposed to do? Just sit here? Just, just, just sit tight Okay. Till after the break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Time for an Awakening, and we're joined in discussion this evening with Abdullah Abdul Rasak, Malcolm's secretary, for a number of years until the day he was brutally assassinated in the Audubon Ballroom. We're going to go straight to the phones. Uh, uh, questions. Can I ask you a favor? Yes, sir. Yeah, before that, just I'd like to say uh, if Brother Aaron X. Wright is still alive and Brother George X. Padmore uh, and the brothers that I met and the sisters uh, at uh, the mosque in uh, Philadelphia. I used to come there regularly, and I uh, enjoyed the fruits of brotherhood. And I particularly enjoyed looking at and talking to the sisters in Philadelphia because they were very 
a, a little soft and a little more feminine than the sisters in New York. And uh, uh, I have very, very, very fond memories of coming there. Uh, Brother Aaron had a barber shop. I don't know if he's still alive, but if so, I'd like to send a greeting to everyone there. Hopefully he's listening. Uh, okay. We're going to go to Joe in Germantown. Joe? How you doing, Brother Elliot? How are you, sir? I'm doing fast. Shalom, Brother Elliot. Shalom, Brother Reggie. You know, yeah. Alaikum like salam. It's, it's, it's good interlude, uh, 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 Brother Elliot Reggie, to pray Brother Gil Scott Heron, Heron and make peace and blessing be upon that brother for his transition. I just want to say it's such an honor, Brother Abdullah, to talk to you, brother. I just go, I'm just sitting here mesmerized, brother, listening to you, and I can say it's an honor by the grace of Allah to talk to you because I'm so glad a brother finally came on this station and set the record straight because I was just doing a slow burn when I heard certain brothers call this station and they quote Manny Marable's book trying to, you know, the 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 fame, brother Malcolm, trying to call him a homosexual because that—that's that, insulting. It's Listen. disrespectful, and it's, and it's brother, downright, and it's downright disgrace, disgraceful. Brother, not only is it insulting in his own book. That's right. He says he says that he says brother Malcolm, and and somebody else was shaking talcum powder. Yeah. We we getting a little interference, Joe. Yeah, yeah, I, I, well, I, I close it. I close with this, brother Alex. I'm, I'm on my cell phone right now, and and, I, and I'm glad, brother Abdullah, setting the record straight because because it's always a tendency and the Caucasian, the devil, the designers, whatever you want to call these people, they always want to use our people to, to destroy each other. So they use Manny Marable to put this nigga up to write in the book, the fame of Malcolm, you know, you know, questioning the brother's manhood and his sexual, and and and, it's, and, it, and it got to be challenged. And then and then any be self-respecting black man or woman would do just what Brother Abdul is doing, and they're challenging like them lies and, and misinformation. So I applaud, and, 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 and may Allah continue to bless you, Brother Abdul, for doing what you're doing. Don't let these devils sit there and defame our great black leaders, our heroes and sheroes. So I just got number much love and respect for you, Brother, for doing what, you, for, for doing, what you're doing tonight, setting the record straight. I'm thank, thank you for your call, Joe. as alaikum. alaykum. And the brother used the term that I think we should understand, that... Uh, Ozzy Davis used. He said that Malcolm was all black manhood. So how do you negate manhood? By making him a homosexual. And there's no evidence, no evidence of homosexuality in Manning Marable's book. Manning Marable even says that when Malcolm was in prison, he wanted a cell facing the east and couldn't get it. And he wrote a letter saying, or either he said, that you get all of these, you give a cell to all of these homosexuals so they can be with their husbands, but I'm trying to get a cell facing the East and, and, and I can't get it. That upset him. And I, I'll tell you this I have been around homosexuals because I've been in show business. <clears throat> and uh, I was around Brother Malcolm, and I never, I'm from New York City. I wasn't born in Duda Diddy, there ain't no town and ain't no city. So homosexuality was like nothing new to me. But I never saw Brother Malcolm do, say anything that would lead me to believe a questioning of his, uh, of his uh, sexuality. You know, the funny thing to me is this. J. Edgar Hoover never married. J. Edgar Hoover had lunch every day with, I think, Clyde Olson. I have a video in which a woman says J. Edgar Hoover was a homosexual. And they say that the reason that uh, J. Edgar Hoover denied the existence of organized crime is because he had so homosexual relationships with a man named Giaconti. But nobody, everybody in the FBI and throughout the United States denies J. Edgar Hoover's homosexuality. Malcolm married, which J. Edgar Hoover didn't. Malcolm fathered six children. J. Edgar Hoover fathered none. There's nobody that I know of that knew Malcolm will point to any kind of evidence justifying Malcolm being called a homosexual. Malcolm was in an organization. He organized mosques throughout the United States. He was in Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, Connecticut, Los Angeles, Chicago, Michigan. And nobody, nobody called Brother Malcolm a homosexual after his death. And then it was people who never met Malcolm. <laughs> well, you addressed it, sir. 
Let's go to Jacob. Jacob? Jacob in West Philly. Jacob? Assalamu alaikum, brother. How are you, sir? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, brother, the, the Harold you talk about, I was going to tell you, uh, Brother Harold here, who, uh, you know, Malcolm was sent to Philadelphia by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, yes. set up Temple Number 12. Yes. And uh, Brother Harold, he was a boxer. He even boxed with Ibam W.D. Muhammad a little while. I don't know if that's the Harold you're talking about, but he actually lived with Malcolm when Malcolm was here in Philadelphia. And the stories that he would tell me about Malcolm is like what you're telling me. That he was a he was a fine man. He was a nice, funny man. He made people feel, you know, welcome anytime they came in his presence. You know, yes. And I mean, the, the crazy stuff. We don't we don't listen to that kind of stuff because we know Malcolm for what he was, and and uh, that's all it is. And we know people will tell lies on people, especially when they're not living to uh, defend themselves. You know, yes. I um. I came into the nation uh, in the early 70s. I was here in Philadelphia, William 87X. And, right. uh, you know, I'm still Muslim, alhamdulillah. But, alhamdulillah. you know, a lot of times people, they look at Malcolm at one stage of his life. And like you were saying, uh, in about a year or so after he, you know, split with the nation, he still he had a metamorphosis. And yeah. he accepted the world community of Islam as Islam should be accepted. A lot of people don't like to understand that. They want to see Malcolm in his infancy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't know, um, you know, if that's, uh, you know, in other words, I want to see the total Malcolm. I want to see him when he came out and was a butterfly. You know, some people would like to see him when he was in still a cocoon as a, uh, a caterpillar or something. You know what I'm saying? But we want to see the full Malcolm, and it, it's really something to be proud about. To see how yes, man. Yes, uh, yes. You know, but so. I want to explain to you a, a, a danger. Those of us who knew Malcolm are very few. Uh, I am. I think I'm the only person alive who was in the nation with Malcolm, out in the nation with Malcolm, and was an official in both organizations. There's nobody else alive that that that, that, that is in that uh, position, and uh, uh, we have an obligation. When a when a publishing company like the Vantage, what what the publishing company publishes a book in in one day, fifty thousand people buy that book, brother. Yeah. And these people never saw Malcolm, never met him, uh, never conversed with him. And I want to say this too. I, I, I want you to listen to very close to this because Malcolm was above anything. And let me explain to you why I say this, because most people, even Muslims, don't understand Malcolm. Yes. Malcolm said he wanted freedom, justice, and equality for the so-called Negro, and he wanted it now. And he would obtain it how? By any means necessary. He said that over and over and over again, and nobody understands it. So you got the Sunnah Muslims say, oh, he was a Sunnah Muslim. The brothers in the nation, oh, he was made by uh, Mr. Muhammad. The, uh, the Muslims in the East, oh, he came to the true Islam. Uh, all kinds of confusion. The socialists, oh, he was moving toward socialism. The communists, oh, he was moving toward communism. The integrationists, oh, he was moving toward integration. All of those things are mean. None of those things were Brother Malcolm's goal. I hate to, I hate to break people's bubble. Malcolm said, by any mean necessary, whatever the means. Now, some people chose to think that Brother Malcolm means, well, we go, go, go get guns and shoot up people. If that was necessary, Malcolm said, fine, let's go. Let's start the party. Right? Yes. When he said the ballot or the bullet, his assumption was that in a country that brazenly goes throughout the world and calls itself the citadel of democracy, that they would choose the ballot rather than the bullet. And Malcolm said, well, my, my, my means is any means necessary, whatever means they want. When you when you get in a real struggle, brother, if 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 you are in the ocean and you are drowning, and somebody send you a sofa, and somebody else send you a, a a stick, and somebody else send you a log, are you are you concerned on how you get out the water? 
No. You want to get out the water. And I'm going to tell you a, a very interesting thing. Brother Malcolm was in prison. And I'm going to tell you how Brother Malcolm told me he got in the nation. He said people come telling him about Mr. Muhammad, this, that, and the other. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. But he said his brother Reginald was a master psychologist. And his brother came to him, and all he said is this. He said, Malcolm, would you like to get out of prison? Like to get out of here? He said Reginald asked him the one question to which everybody in jail would say, yeah. So he said, yeah, I want to get out of here. And he said Reginald didn't say join the nation. Reginald said stop eating pork. So Malcolm stop eating pork. <laughs> Gradually he got him out of the nation. I'll tell you another thing that the, uh, Sheikh Hassoun, Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun from uh, Omdurman and Khartoum was sent over here to teach us his tongue. And he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't say, stop drinking. He said, don't pray when you do Then he said, don't drink before you pray. And gradually, the prescription against intoxicating beverages, intoxicating things was instituted. He didn't just do it overnight. So, uh, Malcolm was a man... He had been in the nation, and brother, you see, you were in the nation. Brother William, 87, you say? Yes, in Philadelphia, yes. Okay, let me tell you something that we were never taught in the nation. And first I have to say, I love the nation and Mr. Muhammad. And to this day, I'll say I'm a Mr. Muhammad. I don't care what nobody think about it. Yes. Because we didn't smoke, we didn't drink, we didn't prostitute, we didn't go around beating our women. We had an MGT and GCC, a class to teach our women how to take care of their children, how to cook, how to sew, how to take care of their husbands, and in general, how to act at home and abroad. And I defy anybody to look me in the eye and tell me we don't need an MGT now. That's right. Jacob, I want to I thank Walker you for your call. Down. Thank you. And we're waiting for your book, too, brother. <laughs> I, I, I'm working on it, brother. Yes, sir. Inshallah. So I want to And wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Brother Razak, before we wind up tonight, um, let me ask you something in reflection. And we talked about this uh, off the air. You mentioned earlier that uh, after Malcolm formed the OAAU, that he didn't last a year. In that ballroom that evening, uh, I asked you in retrospect, looking back, did you see anything? Did you notice anything that was funny out of place you know looking back at that situation uh tell me tell me tell the audience what uh what your feelings was and what you thought about that that evening in that ballroom oh uh, well just a part of me died too a part of all, a, a part of all of us died but some of us were just not aware of it you know, it's like you cut a chicken's head off. The body don't know that the head ain't there no more because the body ain't got no feeling. The head be laying there and the chicken be flopping around. And I, to be frank, I assumed that the nation had killed Malcolm. And as I said, I had a three fifty seven Magnum. I was going to shoot Joseph, who was my captain, who had been my captain. But I had Sheikh Hassoun there. And I had to, I left the Audubon ballroom and I came back to get Sheikh Hassoun. Now, then when they arrested uh, first Norman 3X Butler, and I asked Reuben, Reuben is the man who shot Tal Mejia. And uh, he shot somebody else before he shot Tal Mejia, but that's all hidden. In any event, I said, well, was Norman here? And nobody that had been in the Muslim mosque said that Norman was there. They said, no, Norman wasn't here. I said, then they arrested Thomas, Thomas 15X Johnson. And I said, well, was Thomas here? And they said, no. Well, then I got worried because I said, well, the nation, if they arrested two brothers that were in the nation and nobody can attest that they were in the Audubon ballroom, then they're covering up for somebody. The nation didn't do this because those were two brothers that were in the nation that were arrested for the murder and spent a combination of over 40 years in jail, then who did this and why is somebody covering up for those who did it by arresting people who didn't have nothing to do with it? And, and then you remember Brother Malcolm's house had been firebombed on the 14th 
uh, a week before he was killed. And then the, the mosque, number seven, was firebombed. So I said, this is a classical case of divide and conquer. They want us to fight and kill one another. So uh, a brother, uh, Muhammad Ahmed, Professor Muhammad Ahmed from Temple University, uh, came to me with a newspaper called Malcolm Lives, and he asked me what would I like published in the newspaper. And those who were in the nation would know lesson number one, question number four, why did we run Yaqub and his made devil from the root of civilization across the desert and the hot sands what is uh, into the caves of Europe, what is the meaning of EU and ROPE, and how long before Yaqub taught the devil of the forgotten technology? And the answer is because he started making trouble among the righteous people, telling lies, causing them to fight and kill one another. And so I had that published in the paper because now my primary uh, a responsibility, I felt, was to see to it that Muslims don't fight and kill one another because Yaqub started making, telling lies, causing them to fight and kill one another. So I, a, a, a part of me still didn't come back alive, brother. A part of me just, just died with Malcolm, and that's why they killed him the way they killed him. If there are any Haitians listening to this, they'll know about Baron Samadhi or Baron Kalafor, the, 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 uh, the Lord of the Crossroads. During slavery, when they killed a man, they left him hanging on a tree at the crossroads so everybody could see him in order to instill fear into the rest of the slaves. Well, nothing has changed except the name. The name has changed and the game remains the same. They do the same thing nowadays, and Malcolm, Malcolm could have been assassinated. He wasn't assassinated. He was butchered. He was killed in front of his family and in front of the people that, that maintained their that obtained their spiritual sustenance from him. So by killing him in the manner that they killed him, they killed the desire in all of us. That's their job. That's what they do. And this dog, J. Edgar Hoover, was responsible for it. He had Marcus Garvey run out of the country. He was involved in Fred Hampton's killing. Uh, but every, all of the intellectuals, they want to find some fault with Malcolm instead of focusing their energy upon the people who did this, who was the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Bureau of Special Services of the New York City Police Department. And if I'm not right, then ask me, who killed Nat Turner? Was he assassinated or executed? Who killed Gabriel Prosser? Was he assassinated or executed? Who killed uh, Denmark Vesey? Was he executed or assassinated? Who killed, who was responsible for Tuasab Lovejoy's murder? It was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. He put him on an island and left him to die. So whenever someone emerges, and I'm going to close by saying this, there was a little man named I.F. Stone. He had a newspaper called I.F. Stone's Weekly. He interviewed me, came from Washington, D.C. to interview me. And he asked me, he said, what do you think is going to happen to Malcolm? And Mr. Muhammad taught us this. He said, whenever somebody descended from slaves asks you a question, he's not looking for an answer. He's trying to find out if you know the answer. He said, and to prove this, whenever somebody asks you a question like that, act like you're thinking for the answer and then ask him the same question back. So the late I.F. Stone asked me, what do you think is going to happen to Malcolm? So I scratched my head and looked to the left, looked to the right, looked down at the floor. And I said, what do you think is going to happen to Malcolm? You know what he said to me? He said the last people who owned slaves were the Greeks. That, and they owned some slaves called the Helots. And he said whenever someone among them started a rebellion, they killed him. And that's when I knew that Malcolm was going to be killed. So does that answer your question? Yes, sir. And okay. I want to thank you for being a part of history, for being a part of our program this evening. And I want to thank uh, Professor Ahmed for uh, setting yeah. this interview up for thank us. Thank him. Thank him. He's a good man. And, I'm and gonna... he's one of few people that I've spoke with or for the new brother Malcolm. All the rest of them are Johnny Come Lately guessing, playing guessing games. And Marable should have tried to write a movie script because... What he wrote was like a novel. 
I'm okay. going to be in contact with you, sir, so I can get you uh, what I promised. That's all I ask. Thank you, sir. Okay. Salam alaikum. I want to thank everybody for listening to the program this evening. Excellent discussion as always. And we'll be back next week, Lord willing, to continue on this path towards an awakening. Stay